Um, I'd like to welcome everyone to um, Chatting with Charlie. This is the second program that I'm hosting um, with Charlie, and I'm Sharina Garcia, the Strategy and Innovation Partner with WR Immigration. I'm joined with Charlie Oppenheim, who recently joined our firm and leads our government relations group. He'll give you more about his background, but he was the chief of the State Department's visa control unit for 23 years. And this is where he directed all numerically controlled immigrant visas, which we commonly know as green cards. Um, so what we're gonna do in this webinar is we're gonna pick up where we left off in our last webinar and review the predictions and the February visa bulletin. And today I'm also joined with Laura, our senior associate, who'll discuss issues that are on the top of mind for many of our global mobility managers. We can change the slide. So just a legal disclaimer, this is not legal advice, informational purposes only. If you have any um, questions, please reach out to our firm to schedule a consultation with one of our attorneys. If you're new to our firm, just a little bit about our firm. WR Immigration is one of the top rated immigration firms. Um, we, have, we have actually developed with Salesforce our technology called RAPID which is really cutting edge and revolutionizing the immigration services industry and how we provide services to our client. We were just nominated, or I was just nominated for a Legal Week Award um, for innovation in our field. So really excited about that. Um, and we're gonna talk a little bit more later and show you some of our technology and how many of our uh, clients are actually utilizing the information we can get from our database to be able to um, make predictions or run a more efficient and lean global mobility program. So again, I'm Sharina Garcia. I'm the strategy and innovation partner here at WR Immigration. I'm based in the San Francisco Bay Area and we have Charlie. So Charlie, why don't you give you, provide a little short introduction? Okay. As mentioned, I was uh, employed by the U.S. Department of State for over 43 years from January of 1998 until I retired in December of 2001. I was responsible for the control of all of the numerically controlled immigrant visa categories. Uh, the decisions I made over those years resulted in over 9 million immigrant visas being issued or adjustments of status occurring. I was routinely contacted by the White House and congressional staff to provide analysis of immigration reform proposals, which they were considering or had introduced, and often asked to provide suggestions which could be done to uh, achieve their goals. And I was also asked to testify before Congress on two occasions regarding the uh, employment and family visa it process. Thanks, Charlie. And we also have Laura here. So Laura, why don't you introduce yourself as well? thing. I'm Laura Blanares. I'm a senior associate with WR in our LA office. I specialize in supporting large immigration programs to the tune of thousands of employees. I support efficiencies, developing new policies, and making sure the program has what it needs for a dynamic environment. Thanks. With that, let's move along and let's go through our roadmap and talk a little bit about what uh, you can hear from us today in our one hour. So we're gonna do a brief summary of the employment-based immigrant visa numerical allocation. The prior webinar, which you can find uh, on our YouTube video from December, kind of ran through the basics with Charlie. So if you want a refresher, you can look there. Um, prediction and trends. We're gonna look at the January visa bulletin and do a recap, and then look at the February visa bulletin, which just came out as well and then look at a real uh, common case profile for HR that we're gonna discuss. So with that, we have our next slide. And Charlie, can you walk us through this slide and how the immigrant visa numerical allocation works when there's um, extra numbers? Sure. Uh, there are an, is an overall annual limit. This for fiscal 2023, it'll be approximately 197,000 visas. Those are made available in each uh, to the five categories with the first, uh, second, and third preference being entitled to 28.6% of the overall limit and the fourth and fifth, 7.1%. 
any unused employment first preference numbers can fall and be used in the employment second preference category. If there are any unused employment second, they can go to the third and be used there. The fourth and fifth preference categories, there is no fall down provision for there. But if any of those fourth and fifth preference numbers are going to be unused, they fall up and can be used in the employment first preference category, which provides a tremendous benefit to the employment first preference applicants. And until uh, recently had allowed the India and China employment first preference dates to remain current for an extended period of time. So Charlie, when you say EB4 and EB5 rolls, rolls up to EB1, does that mean those numbers then roll down to EB2, EB3, or do they just stay in EB1? Yes, if uh, so they get they would get added to the original overall employment first preference limit. And then if any of those numbers were unused, which is often the case, then they would, as you said, fall to second. And potentially, if they were still unused, fall to third. But in recent years, any all of the EB2 numbers have been used and there hasn't been any fall down to EB3. And that has resulted in the somewhat slower movement of many of the EB3 dates for China and India. So historically, EB4 and EB5, have they used up all their demand? Until COVID time, yes. Uh, and the for the past year or so, the EB4 has continued to use uh, up, up to their limits. So there has been minimal unused numbers. Because of the EB-5 situation, most of those visas in the past have been issued and processed overseas in Guangzhou. And because of post closures at overseas post, many, and unfortunately, uh, the vast majority of EB-5 numbers in recent years have gone unused. Uh, that is situation is will be changing for the current fiscal year when many more EB-5 numbers will be utilized. Okay, thanks. Let's go to the next slide. So we wanted to give you a visual and the visual is like water flowing down. So what are we talking about? So EB-1, like Charlie said, um, if there's unused numbers, it flows down to EB-2. And then if there's unused numbers, EB-3. Um, and then, of course, the EB4, EB5 also gets put in that top pot, too. Um, and so that's the typical flow, if you want to just kind of really break it down as to how the unused numbers flow down. Um, but let's talk about how does the USCIS make its decisions regarding the use of the employment base and the application filing date. So, Charlie, can you walk us through this slide? Sure. Uh, since October of 2015, the USCIS has allowed applicants to use the application filing dates to file their petitions for adjustment of status at an earlier point in the fiscal year. And to determine whether this will be allowed, they will look at the overall limit. In this example, it would be 200,000. And Based on the application filing dates, which have been determined, they may decide that there are potentially 110,000 applicants who would be eligible. Then they would also look at how many numbers have been used up to the point they're making the decision and would see that 60,000 numbers have been used, but that would still leave 30,000 numbers under the original 200,000 limit available. And the Immigration Service says that to allow the application filing dates to be used and allow applicants to file much earlier, that there must be numbers immediately available for use. So in this case, they would say for the month of January, they will allow those application filing dates to continue to be used. Okay, and then when, so fiscal year 2023 annual limit, that's set at 200,000, right? And yes. then the potential demand, how do they determine the potential demand? That would be the amount of applicants who have filed petition to be accorded immigrant status and have some type of immigrant status in one of the employment first through fifth preference categories. And then they would look back and say, okay, for October through December, 
we've already used 60,000 numbers. And that's where they would subtract the original, the 110 and then the 60 and result in that 30,000 figure. So just to boil it down, Laura, for the potential demand, this is basically when the I-140 is approved and they've locked in their priority date and their category. That's right. That's right, right? So that's what we're looking at. And that's what the Department of State and the USCIS is looking at. Then the actual number used, Charlie, that's the actual number of green cards approved or immigrant visas issued? Correct. Okay. And then what's left over is whatever is in terms of the what's what's the demand, right? So correct. That's how many that. numbers are still remaining that can be used. Okay. I got that. So I think I'm following along with you there. So let's go to the next slide. Okay. Right. So now the February visa bulletin has been published and they would look again at the original 200,000 limit. The original application filing dates, which were announced would allow 110,000 people to potentially file for adjustment of status or use visas from overseas. Uh, they would say, okay, for the months of October through uh, January, they actually 90,000 visas for adjustment of status had occurred. So, so when you subtract those two figures, you come back down to zero immediately available. So they would say, okay, for the month of February, we will no longer allow the application filing dates to be used. And then applicants who wish to file for adjustment of status would have to refer to the uh, chart A final action dates. And that would be for the remainder of the fiscal year. Okay, so just to kind of recap from the last slide, so the limit is 200,000, and then the potential demand is 110,000. So that leaves us with 90,000 numbers, right? But then well, the number actually used is 90,000. So we end up with zero. In the prior example, the number actually used was 60,000, and there was still 90,000 numbers left. So that's how we came up with the 30,000. So in this February visa bulletin example, which really isn't true for February, right? Because they actually are used using dates for filing for this month. Correct. Yes. So this is purely an example of how they the process they may go through to determine whether the ch uh, chart B application filing dates can be used for advanced filing or if they would decide that only the chart A final action dates can be used. So in this month's February visa bulletin, they determined that there are still immediately available numbers. That's why they've kept it so that now individuals can still apply or file their, their adjustment of status. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. All right. And then using your crystal ball, Charlie, do you predict that the application filing dates will no longer be used in the future and we're just going to be using final action dates? I would expect them within the next few months to uh, only allow the chart A final action dates to be used. All right. So, so, we'll so I think that people should, if they are contemplating filing, they should do so as quickly as possible uh, before USCIS makes a decision, decision not to allow the application filing dates to be utilized. And they, post that information on the USCIS website. Yeah, okay. And then um, we can go to the next slide. So this slide goes through the actual limits for each year, fiscal year 2019 to current. Um, and we're gonna use this to, to run through some prediction and trends. So if we look at fiscal year 2019 worldwide um, limit, 141,918. We look at fiscal year 2020, 156, 253. And then fiscal year 2021, it jumps up, 262, 288. Fiscal year 2022 jumps up again, 281, 507. And then fiscal year 2023, we see it go down to 197. And then fiscal year 2024, it's estimated to be at 150, which is in between fiscal year 2019 and 2020 numbers. 
So Charlie, can you kind of walk us through what's happening here and how are these num uh, these fiscal year limits uh, determined? Uh, yes, the employment-based annual limit is a minimum of 140,000. And to that total, you would add any unused family numbers from the previous fiscal year that under their limit. So for uh, in fiscal 2019, there were 1,918 unused family numbers, which were able to be added from the 2018 family limit were added on to 2019. There was unused, there were once again, but not a few more unused family numbers, which increased the fiscal 2020 annual limit. And as everyone knows, starting in about March of 2020, the COVID issues resulted in many of, or most of the overseas posts being shut down uh, and had limited processing. Most of the family visas are processed overseas, probably 95%. And because of the COVID-related post closures, very few numbers were being used. Therefore, for fiscal 21, 22, and once again in 23, the annual limits for employment were at all time highs. And for example, the 2022 annual limit for employment was twice the normal limit. Therefore, the cases, employment cases in fiscal year 2022, the most recent, they were processed at a much faster pace than normally would occur and would much faster than can be expected to incur in the future. The 2023 limit is declining. And I believe that for fiscal 2024, we will be back at where the vast majority of family numbers will have been utilized in 2023, resulting in a very uh, more normal limit for employment in 2024 and beyond. So Charlie, let me, let me just walk through this example for you just to understand. So fiscal year 2022, using that as an example, 281,507. You said for employment base, it's typically one, it's always 140,000 allocated, right? But that would mean there were 141,000 or 142,000 unused family base numbers. Is that right? Correct. So in 2021, there were approximately 141,507 unused family numbers, again, because ni about 95% of the family numbers are processed overseas. During fiscal 2021, COVID issues resulted in limited processing at foreign service posts. Oh, wow. So that's why we have increased. But now they're catching up. Their posts are opening. And so now we're going to start seeing numbers go back to normal, which is more around the 2019-2020 range. Right? Correct. Okay. Therefore, people that were, you know, got used to rapid processing during fiscal 2022 uh, should expect slower processing this current year and going forward. Okay. So then we look at the first preference. And when we look at fiscal year 2019 and 2020, it's running about 40 thousand, 44,000. And then we see a spike in 2021, 2022. So 75,000 and then 80,000. And then it drops down to 56. And then the prediction is it's going to be 42,900. So can you kind of walk us through that prediction as well? Yes. Uh, with that 80,000 limit in first preference, there was not, because all of the categories were current throughout fiscal 2022, there was not enough demand to fully utilize all 80,511 numbers. And as the earlier uh, slide showed, any of those unused numbers could fall down and then be added to the second preference normal limit of 80,511. And again, that allowed many more applicants, particularly in India's second preference category, to be processed during the past fiscal year. And also as well, there were, although there were no fall down to employment third, that third preference limit for 2022 was 
almost, well, was approximately twice as high as it had been in 2019, allowing many more Indian third preference applicants to be processed in fiscal 2022. And as you see with the numbers dropping from 80,000 to the 56,000 level, that will mean far fewer people will be processed this year. And again, even fewer in 2024 and beyond. So if we use our um, visual with the water flowing, so in fiscal year 2022, we had first preference at 80,000, and then there were unused numbers and it flowed to second preference. And then in 2022, were all the numbers used in second preference, so it flowed down to third, or did it stop at second? Uh, I believe when the data is published, we'll find that virtually all of the 80,000 plus numbers were used in the second preference category. And then you said before in our last webinar that the highest demand is, well, for the unused numbers, you go with the, the individual who has the oldest priority date and who's been waiting in line the longest, right? Correct. Any of the otherwise unused numbers under the annual limit are made available strictly in priority date order. And typically in the both the first and second preference category, typically Indian applicants have the earliest date. So they provi are provided with a tremendous benefit in the amount of the uh, Indian employment second and third preference applicants who can be processed. Okay, so typically the numbers are used by Indian second preference for the unused Correct. numbers. Correct. Not usually third preference. Uh, 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 there is a large number of additional numbers under the normal third preference number use. So even though there's no fall down of unused second preference numbers, if there are going to be otherwise unused numbers under the normal 80,511 category limit, any of those unused numbers can be made available again, strictly in priority date order, and that benefited the Indian third preference applicants tremendously during fiscal 2022. So basically, the Indian nationals were able to benefit from the fall down from EB1 to EB2, and they were also able to benefit if they were in third preference from the extra numbers that were left for the EB3 category that were unused by the other countries. Correct. When uh, the State Department eventually publishes their data regarding number use uh, for fiscal 2022, I you will see that uh, at the bottom of the chart, it indicates that the per country limit for each of those categories is 5,636. In each of the first, second, and third preference categories, you will see most likely that India used tens of thousands more numbers than that, that limit. I gotcha. Okay, I understand. Um, and then, Laura, let's talk about how all of this plays out in your corporate global mobility programs. Um, so can you kind of walk us through what happens in your world in terms of all these employment-based annual limits? Yeah, so kind of putting story to the chart here is you might recall for our program leaders in October of 2020 when we saw the huge forward movement for EB3, specifically EB3 India, we filed record number of AOS applications as well as I-140s in the EB3 category for companies that supported it. So that year or filing in October of 2020, we saw USAS slow to receipt all of those applications. And while many later were able to receive green cards, so many of those applications continue to remain pending because of the forward backward movement in the EB3. Uh, the story last year was folks that filed EB3 in October of 2020 to lodge their AOS application. And to put that in perspective, there's great benefit to file an adjustment of status application uh, because after 180 days of that application remaining pending, that foreign national employee can port their adjustment of status application to another employer. So there's great protections for, for that foreign national employee as well as the 
concurrent benefit of an EAD advanced parole. So for those foreign nationals, they can use the advanced parole in place of a visa stamp. So especially in light of COVID closing consular posts, having that advanced parole document was, was key for international travel in a COVID consular post closure world. Um, so that's some context there. But the last year, we saw a record number of upgrade downgrades. Um, this is where we were looking to attach the pending adjustment of status back to the second preference because that line started moving faster. And Sharina, you use this example often where it's like changing lanes. So in October of 2020, we filed in the EB3 lane because that was the one that advanced that allowed the filing of the adjustment of status. And then in February of 2022, we saw the EB2 India lane advance. So everybody moved their application into the EB2 lane. Um, for some, we saw movement and approvals, but for many, it remains pending. Um, so as you can see that there were record number of immigrant visas available or green cards available, but it still didn't capture the thousands of applications that were filed from the um, tremendous advancement in fiscal year 2021. Okay, and then when we're looking at that, so Charlie, can you just kind of help us understand with Laura saying that people are moving from one lane to the other, EB2 to EB3, back to EB2, when is the actual number allocated when you're trying to determine who used what number? Is it when the immigrant visas issued? Is it when the adjustment of status is approved? When is that actual number allocated to either the second or third preference? Yes, for example, in the uh, USCIS adjustment of status process, they will only request a visa number when the case is ready for actual adjustment of status resulting in the quote green card ultimately being produced. So the upgrade or downgrade uh, if, if the case is being downgraded, the State Department only knows about it in the originally filed preference category until the last minute. So uh, the, again, the number use is at the time of final action by immigration service or the issuance of a visa overseas. So if we go back to our prior slides where we were talking about what the government expects in terms of demand by the USCIS and also Department of State, right, the potential demand number, you're looking at the date the I-140 was filed and what category was checked there, correct? Right? But then so, in the, re the reality is, is that if I'm a USCIS officer and I've requested the medical exam as an RFE and the medical exam comes, I'm approving that case under EB3, but you didn't sure. know that because you thought it was EB2. Exactly. Gotcha. And so, so that can that can cause a little fluctuation. That's why the EB3 date may advance at a more rapid pace for a period of time until many more of those EB2 downgrades are received and resulting in third preference number use and vice versa it is slowing the movement of the second because you've got all that, quote, pent up demand that you're considering. Okay, and then, so I, so Laura and I, right, Laura, we try and predict for our clients what's gonna happen. So based on these numbers and based on what we see, we typically will be conservative, right, Laura? And we'll say at least, um, you know, 18 months to two years if you're an EB1, if you're from China or India, we give longer time frames. But what are we actually seeing now, Laura? Yeah, yeah. Last year we saw some huge variety of processing times. So, for an example, I had an EB1 where we filed this multinational manager concurrent with the adjustment of status, and you know we quoted conservatively the 18 to 24 months, but we saw the I-140 approved in record time and the AOS approved immediately after. So 
this gentleman got their green card in eight months, which is record time. Um, and again, it makes sense given the numbers here on this chart that there were record numbers available. It just didn't reflect what commonly was the processing time in, in years past. So it was, it was really unique situation that um, some of these petitions, specifically EB1, were processed faster than we've ever seen historically. So are you going to start telling clients that green cards could be approved in eight months? Probably not, right? <laughs> I don't think so. And especially given the conversation here and what our, you know, what Charlie's alluding to, that these numbers of available immigrant visas or green cards in the years to come are going to be reduced back to the levels we were most familiar with in fiscal year 2019 and 2020. So last year and the last two years were really an anomaly. I always yep. say that that person must have prayed to the right gods or done something, you Certainly, know, and should probably yeah. buy a lottery ticket if they got their adjustment approved in eight months. <laughs> so yeah. that's usually what I say. It's, it's also important to remember that the immigration service, because all of the numbers were not used in fiscal 2021, their top priority for fiscal 2022 was to maximize number use. So it was kind of an all hands on deck to expedite the processing of petitions and final action on cases. And often a newly filed case based on somebody that was able to file because of the movement of either the application filing dates or final action date, that newer filed case sometimes can be adjudicated at a faster pace, allowing somebody that recently filed to get, receive their adjustment of status faster than somebody that had filed earlier and was having to update documents, et cetera. And again, it was an all hands on deck operation uh, for 2022. Yeah, we saw that because what they were doing was they were sending all a lot of the cases to the local offices. So we're actually getting approvals from Miami, from, from local offices, right? Um, and we're getting requests for evidence. And I think that's where you would see, you know, Laura, in our real world examples where someone who's been patiently waiting, right, two years or whatever, and then all of a sudden we file a case and then within seven, eight months, this person gets their green card, right, while the person is still waiting. Um, that could be also the example of someone who changes lanes and went from EB2 to EB3 and went back to EB2 but the person who made the decision back in October of 2020 not to change lanes and to just stay in their lane, and then when the date opened that they could file, filed, their case may have actually been approved faster than the person who went from two to three back to two. Is that right, Charlie? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, Sharina, we saw that play out a lot. And sometimes um, whether a company was supporting the upgrade downgraded informed you know, that foreign national, whether they would proceed with that. And some foreign nationals weren't eligible. They might've had the priority date from a prior employer, but we're still processing through PERM with their new employer. And so we're not eligible to file an EB3 AOS concurrent in October in 2020. And when their PERM was approved, then they were eligible to file the EB2 and the AOS. And those cases we saw, like you said, get approved more quickly. So they sort of benefited. They were um, very frustrated in October of 2020, but as it played out, their case actually got adjudicated faster through USAS because of all of um, the sort of crush from EB3 filing to then the upgrade. So it was, again, a, a very bizarre couple of years of how things played out. Yeah, and then there's always my friend who got their case approved in seven months or three months, right? There's always a friend. So it actually was happening um, in fiscal year 2022 um, and still happening maybe a little bit now. We don't know, you know, um, it's all play, still playing out. We can go to the next slide where we're going to talk about the visa bulletin. So for this slide, what we did was we actually showed all chargeability and then the cutoff dates for China and India born. So if you look at September, 2022, right, for all chargeability, you see it's all current. And then we go to October, it's still current. November, it's still current. And then we hit December, right? 
um, all chargeability, and then January and February. This means that anyone born in any country, um, not China or India, this is their cutoff date. So Charlie, can you walk us through this and what's happening in December 2022 and why there's a cutoff date? Sure. And uh, through December of 2022, the State Department, in conjunction with Immigration Service, had determined that there were plenty of numbers for any employment first preference applicant, regardless of where they were born. But when they were determining the January 2023 dates, they decided that there were not going to be enough numbers. And therefore, because China and India had already used more numbers than they had under their annual limit that they had to start limiting future number use. Uh, and I think that this, uh, there, it should be expected that there will be an, a, both a China and India employment for, first preference date, at least for the foreseeable future until the State Department may be able to decide that there are additional numbers that are going to be otherwise unused that can flow to use by India and China. But again, I would expect this date to uh, potentially hold for the coming months and then potentially start moving at some point in the second half of the fiscal year, April on. So basically for EB1, um, all chargeability, right? It's, it's current. You're not expecting all chargeability to have a cutoff date? Not on a worldwide basis, okay. a, a date only for in, for China and India. And okay, the, reason, the reason that China and India employment first preference ha dates are imposed is because they have already reached their per country limit where countries from the rest, applicants from the rest of the world have not Therefore, numbers under the overall annual limit have to be, quote, saved for use by the countries that have not reached their limit. And only after it's determined that there will still be a numbers available, could those be made available to India and China first. But again, I do not believe that would happen before the second half of the fiscal year. So when the fiscal year opens in October of 2022, by when does China or India usually use up their annual limit, their per country uh, annual limit? In recent years, they would use it, quote, very quickly. But because the rest of the world was not going to require the full use of the annual limit, for example, last year there were 80,000 80, numbers available. If China and India, say, had a their per country limit, that their both of those per country limits would have been subtracted from the overall 80,000 limit. Then state would have made an estimate of how many numbers were gonna be required by the rest of the world. And if they determined that there would still be 20,000 unused numbers, then those 20,000 numbers could be made available to both China and India. And that is what's happened in the past. This fiscal year, They've decided that there will not be as many numbers available to China and India over their limit, and that's why they imposed the date to control things for the time being. So in October, they decided to control it for China, right? For EB2 China, the green is showing how it's actually, the date has moved um, back, right? Um, uh, for, is that right? No, forward? It, forward. It moved, sorry, green it moved is forward, forward red is back. Sorry. Yeah. Green is so, forward. So, so what they so yeah. what they would have done is they would have made a determination that under the China employment second preference per country limit, that they had enough numbers available that they could advance the date for October from the previous April date to the new June date. Then for since uh, then they since uh, October, they've held the date. They have not moved it at all because they decided there is enough demand, potential demand within that June 8th of 2019 prior, uh, final action date to utilize all of the available numbers under the China annual limit. 
I believe that they will hold that date once again for March and then uh, make another determination of when and if they can advance it. Okay, and then for India, we see a red. So, so green is advancing, so it means that the dates are moving. Red is the dates are going backwards. So walk me through EB2 India and what happened in September, October, and then November, December, visa bulletin. Just to give you an example, and this would be under the strict per country limits in fiscal 2022, there were a little over 5,600 numbers available for India third preference plus any uh, unused numbers. This year, there is approximately 4,000. So they had 1,600 fewer numbers that they knew would be available right off the bat. So they determined that they couldn't leave that September date in place because there were too many applicants, India third preference applicants. So they had to retrogress uh, the, the second preference date. And the date they chose, April 1, 2012, is based on the oldest India Old, priority date in EB2? Is that how they figured out? It's not, it's years? the, it would move it back to a point where they could control and limit number use within the overall annual limit. So oh, overall, so, so it's not just so, based on India? No, well, you're speaking about the India second preference date. They decided yeah. based on the India second preference per country limit that they only had enough numbers to process applicants who had a priority date before April 1st oh. of 2012. There were plenty of applicants. Then they held that date for November and then they looked at the amount of applicants who were using visa numbers in India second preference and decided it was much greater than they had anticipated. Therefore, to control the annual limit, they had to have a second retrogression of the date back to October 8th of 2011. And again, these dates, when they're posted, it's in an effort to control the amount of visas which will be issued or adjustment of status under the overall annual limit. So you had mentioned in the past that you didn't typically retrogress twice, right? You would just pull the Band-Aid once. So in this situation, the Band-Aid was pulled twice. <laughs> Correct. It is, it is surprising. I would have, uh, you know, they had to make the October call based on the best information they had available at the time. I, in an ideal world, they would have realized that there was plenty of demand within the October 8th, 2011 date to utilize numbers. They would have set that back in October, and then they could have held that for a while to determine how many numbers, what the demand for use of numbers really was for India second. And then they could have once they had a better idea of what was happening, then they could have potentially slowly started advancing the date. And again, that's what I think that is happening uh, with some of the other categories where they will hold the date for a, an extended period of time till they get a better feel of how many numbers are being used and how many numbers may be available in the future which may allow them to advance the, the final action date at some future point. Okay, but they got it right under EB3 because it started moving up. Exactly. They, okay, they, gotcha. set, the, they set the correct date at April 12th, April, or excuse me, April 1st, 2012. And then they were able to hold it for November. They got a better feel and they said, okay, we can move it from April 1st to, to June 15th. Now, uh, through February, they've decided to hold that date. I think that they most likely will hold it again for March, and then they can potentially start moving it uh, in April or beyond. So you don't think EB2 is going to retrodress again? Like we're just going to hold at October 11, October 8, 2020, is that 2011? Yeah, 2011. They should have retrogressed it to a point where they do not need to retrogress it again. So that October 8th 
should at this point be considered a worst case scenario and then hopefully at some future point demand will subside and they may be able to uh, decide to advance it again but that may not be until sometime in the second half of the fiscal year they're they're going to want to make sure they don't have the same quote mistake where they have to retrogress the date again okay and then laura let's walk through this what's going on with eb1 now that we heard that premium processing is going to be implemented for eb1 c's and then also for eb2 niw's starting at the end of this month so can you walk us through what we will probably see play out yeah this will be interesting to see how it plays out like Charlie was describing earlier when Department of State is looking at potential demand based on announced dates, the Department of State will likely see an increased demand because we're seeing a faster cycle, we'll see a faster cycle for EB1 multinational manager petitions historically took a year to from filing for adjudication. So we'll likely see those numbers go up. In addition, we'll likely see those numbers go up for national interest waivers, the EB2 category. I think anecdotally, we're seeing more foreign nationals interested in national interest waivers because of premium processing eligibility, but also because national interest waivers don't require an employment offer. So in light of uh, tech companies with layoffs and layoffs in headlines, folks are looking to explore whether they can self-sponsor through national interest waivers. And, and again, with the availability of premium processing, this becomes a very compelling thing to explore for some foreign nationals who may not qualify for EB1, outstanding researcher, or extraordinary ability, but might have the profile to have a national interest waiver approved. So I think we're going to see some increased demands uh, in, in those categories. And what that might mean, and it might take some months to play out, it may mean that the Department of State uh, implements priority dates for the EB-1 category sooner than it historically had, given the faster cycle time for, for those petitions. Yeah, so it's going to go, if you pay premium processing fee, is it still 2500 or is it higher than 2500 it is still 2500 uh, there are some fee increases likely uh coming our way uh the premium processing for the eb1 multinational manager and national interest waiver aren't 15 days it's 45 days for adjudication so i can see a lot of people spending the 2500 right totally to totally and i log. And I think, you know, when premium processing is available, it's generally recommended. There are some cases for strategic reasons why you would not want to file premium processing, but more often than not, especially if a company's policy does support it, it there's great benefit to secure the approval soonest. So it's going to be interesting in our next chatting with Charlie's to see with what happens when premium processing is implemented and how that actually impacts the EB2. So we won't probably see that for a few more months. Um, so that'll be interesting to watch. We can go to the next slide. Okay, Charlie, so based on your <laughs> predictions, is this an accurate visual of where we can see the water flowing where there's no water flowing? <laughs> I, I think so, because as Laura mentioned, there's uh, increased filings. There's already been enough filings in the China and India categories. So the State Department and Immigration Service knows that they have a huge potential pool of demand and therefore they can kind of shut off the flow of water for the time being knowing that once they have a better picture of how many numbers are and are likely to be used they can turn on the flow at a later point in the year and still reach the uh, required annual limits yeah, so this is just, just to recap, we showed a picture of the flow from when there's unused numbers, EB1, EB2, EB3, what we're basically saying, or what Charlie's basically predicting, is that the flow, there's no flow right now, it's going to be held off, and you'll see the numbers stay where they're at, and then once they can see there's more unused numbers, then they can start the flow again, but for now, it's probably going to stay where it's at. So what we want right. to... And 
Uh-huh. Well, and one quick thing, as Laura mentioned, the State Department would make be making estimates of what they were thinking number use was going to be. And if they thought that the monthly number use was going to be 5,000 and they see it's uh, only 4,000, then they know that they have more numbers to be made available in the future. If they were seeing that instead of five, their estimated 5,000, it was six or 7,000, then they know that they're going to have to take some type of corrective action uh, in the future to limit number use. Yeah. Um, so we can go to our hypothetical. So let's talk about this is our upgrade downgrade AOS pending since October 2020 example we want to go through with you. So Laura, Frank is an Indian national. He's held H-1B status since 2009, has a priority date of October 23, 2012. Um, initial I-140 was approved as EB-2 in January 2013 with the banana company. In, uh, these are all fictional, you guys, all fictional. In October 2020, <laughs> banana company supported Frank and filed an I-140 EB-3 concurrently with their ALS application. Again, changing lanes, was in lane EB-2 asked the company if he could switch to lane EB3, and then he could also simultaneously file his green card application. On July 14, 2021, the I-140 EB3 petition was approved, okay? So um, that means that uh, his AOS is still pending, right? Um, on March 15, 2022, Banana Company filed an I-45J because now Frank wants to transfer his pending adjustment from the EB3 lane. So he was EB2, then he went to EB3, and now he's asking the company, move me back to EB2 because he sees in the priority date is moving faster. They receive a receipt notice from the form I-45J filing, but the case is at a standstill, no movement, right? Um, and so Laura, can you kind of walk us through this example and what can the what can Banana Company do to support Frank? So unfortunately, this is a very common scenario for many of our clients. We were kind of alluding it to, to it on uh, a previous slide. Uh, the thing that we're going to be advising Banana Company initially here in, in this sort of case study is there's going to be increased filing fees. So given the slowdown and Frank's priority date, Banana Companies, we're going to advise Banana Company to support H-1B renewals until... Frank's AOS is approved. So we're going to be advising timely H-1B renewals, but also that it comes with a higher price tag with these proposed fee increases from USCIS. We're also going to look at Banana Co's policy for EAD AP renewals uh, because there are going to be more of those renewals as well to keep those current. And does the company have a policy on dependence? So the longer the adjudication time frame for Frank's eventual green card means that Banana Company is going to be paying for more renewals at a higher price tag. So we'll work with the company for those forecasts and that we want to have conversations with all stakeholders, with Frank, with Frank's manager, uh, department lead, cost centers, so that everybody understands just what that time frame might be to reset expectations. Because if we filed back in October 2020, they might be thinking, what's going on? Why is it taking so long? What's what's the holdup here? So give them the, the context that we explained here on this webinar, but also give them some forecasts on when we're expecting some movement for Frank's pending green card and the costs that the company will incur to continue to support Frank's maintenance of status to remain work authorized for Banana Company. Okay, uh, we're in cost cutting mode, Laura. We just went through a round of layoffs, right? We can't really support an H-1B extension and an EAD AP renewal, right? And so what's your response to that when a company says to you, we're in cost cutting mode, we can't afford to, um, you know, maintain the EAD AP and the H-1B extension, what option or what, 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 what do you usually provide as guidance to your companies? Well, first we want to look at the policy. Do you have a policy in place for green card sponsorship that is stating what the company will or will not be supporting? 
And so we'll want to look at that and perhaps this is a good time to revisit what those policies look like. Maybe we're revisiting the company's generous policy to, to support multiple EAD AP renewals um, for the foreign national and their dependents. Maybe it's silent on that, but we certainly want to take a look at that first. Uh, the company cannot pass certain H-1B renewal costs to the foreign nationals. So regulatorily speaking, the fees for the complete fees for H-1B renewals cannot be passed down to the foreign nationals. So one that can be passed to foreign nationals are the EAD and advanced parole renewals. So we have to understand first what the policy on the books for the company says or doesn't say, and then um, what is legally permitted for the company to pass to the employees. So we'd walk through those things and again, use some forecasting reporting to predict what fees will be incurred in the coming quarters. Which brings us to our next slide. <laughs> And so what we want to uh, showcase here is our rapid technology, um, which also provides comprehensive forecasting and reporting use, and especially in this sort of scenario that Laura uh, described for the green card, where you would want to see, okay, what's the cost? What have we been spending? Um, and so what we also have is a slide, another slide, which is just an, a sample report, so we can move to the next slide. Um, you know, this, this immigration program is low, right, Laura, compared to our clients, many of them are in the million dollar range in terms of immigration spend, but we just wanted to use this as an example. Um, and so, Laura, let's walk, kind of walk through, this is a billing, billing and budget sample dashboard report that we can actually run in rapid um, that helps our clients actually plan and predict uh, what is going to be the spend on immigration. So we see for fiscal year 2019 and 2020, the immigration cost was 203000 right? And then can you kind of walk me through to the other charts that we have here? Yeah, so the cost projections, these are the sort of bottom row here. It's based on you know, how the time of the cost. So when we're expecting these fees, legal and filing fees to hit in the upcoming quarters, and then which departments are incurring those costs. So you want to know when the spend is happening and which departments are going to be responsible for it. And then the third, the third square on the bottom is how long or where they are in the process. So as many of us know who support green card sponsorship, the various stages and milestones uh, take take some time. So we're understanding where we are in the process, how long that process is taking to then predict the fees to be incurred in the in the coming quarters. So we have the constant pipeline analysis for your team to have the right relevant conversations with your company stakeholders. Yeah, and then now the conversations we're having is because they published in the Federal Register, the USCIS, the proposed fee increases, right? So a lot of our clients are actually asking us, can you do a cost projection? Because the last time they increased fees in 2016, um, it took them about eight to nine months to actually implement the new fees. So a lot of our clients are asking us to help plan and project what the increased cost will be. And so we're utilizing a lot of our um, budgeting and forecasting reports here in RAPID. I know you can't see it, you all. So if you want a demo, just email us. <laughs> we'll, we'll do a demo for you. We didn't do it on purpose. It's just, it's hard to see. <laughs> um, so we can go to the next slide. Um, so the next chatting with Charlie, thanks Charlie for being here. It's a deeper look again, um, and also looking at the predictions. The next one is slated for Wednesday, February 15 at 11 a.m. Pacific. Save the date. Just make sure you're uh, subscribed to our newsletters. Um, and with that, this will conclude uh, my second chatting with Charlie. And I want to thank Charlie and Laura for being on the panel with me. So thank you. Thanks, Sharina. Thanks. Thanks. All right. Bye.